you did bring your step. Yeah. Yeah. I think you might want it. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I um, do usually. Uh -huh. And we don't need this much. Okay. Testing. There we go. All right, folks, come in, grab a seat. Uh, excited to get this program. Very loud, Mike. Off to start. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this year's President's Award for the Public Engagement Ceremony. I'm Rebecca Cunningham, the Vice President of Research here at the University of Michigan. Today's ceremony is especially exciting because this is our first time celebrating together since 2019. Uh, as a community, we can't begin to solve the world's greatest challenges if we just operate in silos and have our work and scholarship and research operate in those silos. We have a responsibility to ensure that our collective knowledge and discoveries are translated in ways that positively benefit our communities worldwide, and that's why we're here today to celebrate the tremendous societal and public impact generated by you and your colleagues 
across Ann Arbor, Dearborn, and Flint campuses. Maria Eisenberg and Luke Schaefer truly embody the university's commitment to public engagement. From Dr. Eisenberg's tremendous contributions to the public health response amid the COVID-19 pandemic, to Dr. Schaefer's impassioned dedication to leveraging research to help communities and advance social policy. The innovative work led by these two individuals positively impacts our communities by identifying solutions to critical societal challenges. Let's learn more about their incredible public engagement works now with this video. Scholars at the University of Michigan and elsewhere, we just, we can't work in a vacuum. We need to talk to each other and that's incredibly important. Um, learning from each other's research and critiquing it, uh, building on it. But we also need to be connected with communities. I believe, especially, you know, in my own sort of domain of the social sciences, that our, we were really founded for the betterment of the human condition. And so this should be central to what we do, that we should be driven by the interests and the needs of, of communities that we are embedded in. So UM is an incredible hub for discovery, right? And if we want those discoveries to have an impact on the world around us, then we need to do this kind of community and public engagement kind of work, right? We have to engage and translate those discoveries into things that can help people and can, you know, make changes and, and do something. Poverty Youth Solutions is a university-wide initiative. Our charge is to partner with communities and policymakers to find new ways to prevent and alleviate poverty. It really builds on a rich, uh, long tradition of research on poverty and inequality at the University of Michigan. But it tries to take it to the next level of saying, um, let's build on basic research that tells us about the causes and consequences of poverty to really get out into communities and in a rigorous way, bring evidence to bear on ways to make systems work better. Since COVID, I mean, basically my entire research program has shifted to being all about COVID. And so, you know, um, and not just my research program, but all the, you know, public engagement work, you know, all of the other kinds of work that we do, you know, it's been basically shifted to being entirely about COVID. So it's changed the nature of my work, both in terms of the focus shifting to the pandemic, but also the kind of work that I do, you know, shifting from you know, I've always had some interaction with policymakers and, you know, sort of the practical or applied side of public health, but this has really made that the forefront and has shifted my work much more heavily towards interaction with the community and with policymakers and that kind of thing. It really means a lot to me that the University of Michigan has a, an award like this. I think it really elevates the work of, of being engaged in communities and, and trying to make the work of the university have noticeable impact. A lot of times in academia, our, the incentive structure in academia is very narrow in some ways. It's all about publications and things that are shared within the scientific community, which is of course also very important, but um, it's nice to see that this, I think this award is sort of a marker that UM values things that are broader than that and that UM values translating those scientific findings and academic findings into things that can be impactful for the broader community. And I want the communities that we work in to say, you know what, the University of Michigan and Poverty Solutions, but as well as others, they are an asset to us, right? They help us achieve our goals as a community, as people. Receiving this award, I hope that it, it encourages more people at UM and at you know state and local government organizations to think about more possibility for connection and collaboration because it has been really remarkable the kinds of things that you can do in these kinds of partnerships. And there's, I think, a lot more opportunity for this kind of UM government partnership, you know, community organization and government partnerships. Um, you know, there are a lot of possibilities there and ways that I think we could be useful to each other and, and useful to the community at large. And so I hope that um, this award helps to kind of elevate that idea. statements to help us think about uh, collectively and really embody um, what, what we are looking for here at the University of Michigan, which is to have the work have greater impact. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Mary Sue Coleman. 
Uh, president Coleman served as U of M's 13th president from 2002 to 2014 and was reappointed by the Board of Regents earlier this year. From 2016 to 2020, she went on to represent the country's leading research universities as the president of AAU, the Association of American Universities. She has dedicated more than 50 years to public higher education, including leadership roles at the University of Kentucky, the University of North Carolina, the University of New Mexico, and the University of Iowa, where she was president for seven years. Please join me in welcoming Mary Sue Coleman. Our pleasure to have you here today. Well, thank you, Rebecca. I really, because I don't need that. Uh, now wait, I have to get my little stool here. I have a little thing that brings me up. <laughs> so Rebecca doesn't need it, but I do. Um, uh, I'd like to uh, point out that we're expecting uh, Martino Harmon here and uh, Tim Lynch. I don't know if they're here yet, but they're back there. I really appreciate them being there, executive officers, and Chris Cole, who's here today, and I really appreciate uh, Chris, who's gonna be speaking to us later as well. I'd like to thank all of you for being here in person and those who are here remotely, I understand that we're streaming this, uh, to celebrate faculty engagement and this year's award recipients. When you're a faculty member, and I was a faculty member for many years, and so I remember that the demands on your time are enormous. <clears throat> we all become focused on educating and mentoring our students, conducting research, serving our communities and task forces, publishing our work, and the list goes on. Public service and engagement can sometimes feel like one more requirement on the to-do list. But at Michigan, serving society is an integral part of the mission, and this is what I have loved so much about this university. Every day, countless U of M scholars put engagement at the core of their careers without hesitation and with tremendous passion and commitment. That is what makes today's program such a pleasure because it allows us to celebrate two of our most dedicated professors. It's my honor to tell you a little bit about each of our honorees and then invite them to join me on the stage. Our first recipient is Professor Marissa Eisenberg that you saw from the film, who we're honoring with the President's Award for National and State Leadership. Marissa is Associate Professor of Epidemiology in the School of Public Health and Associate Professor of Mathematics and Complex Systems in LS and A. She is the COVID guru in the best sense of the word. Since the start of the pandemic more than two years ago, her modeling has provided state and national leaders with scenarios that they could use to develop responses to the public health crisis. Her forecasts have helped save lives. Local health departments, governors, school superintendents, the CDC, all have used her data to determine what measures to take in fighting the virus. Along the way, she's mentored students and provided them with an invaluable experience of working through a pandemic. At the heart of Marissa's work has been a steadfast commitment to science and to accuracy for which we are all grateful. Marissa, Thank you for your service and your leadership, and would you please join me? Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's now my honor to tell you about Professor Luke Schaefer, the recipient for the President's Award for Public Impact. Luke is a professor of social work and the School of Social Work. In addition, he is the Herman and Amelie Cohn Professor of Social Justice and Social Policy in the Ford School. He directs policy solutions, as we also saw from the video, our university-wide initiative to join forces with policymakers and communities to combat poverty. Luke is passionate about eradicating poverty in the United States among the wealthiest countries in the world. The challenges faced by impoverished families were never more apparent than when the pandemic struck and people lost their jobs. That loss of income was devastating to families already struggling to get by. The expanded child tax credit passed by Congress 
genuinely saved lives by giving families the support they needed to put food on the table and keep the lights on. Luke's research and advocacy were integral to the tax credit and exemplified the importance of translating research into impact. He has advised leaders at all government levels and has managed to write an award-winning book, an award-winning and heartbreaking book about Americans living in poverty. Luke, we are so very proud of you and grateful for the work to shine a light on the most vul vulnerable members of our society. You shape public policy, improve lives, and exemplify the profound impact of Michigan faculty. Please join me here. And now, uh, Marissa and Luke, I think I want you to join us on the stage where we're going to have a panel discussion. So, and Rebecca, you're leading the discussion here, so let us get at it. Thank you, President Coleman. Your long-standing commitment to public engagement is truly incredible, and we're so grateful to you. I would now like to invite our two other panelists to the stage for a deeper discussion about the impact and importance of public engagement. You may join us. Joining President Coleman, Professor Eisenberg, and Professor Schaefer is Dr. Ann Lynn and Dean Bowman. Dr. Lynn is the director of the Lai Berthel Rogel Center for Chinese Studies. She is also an associate professor of public policy. And Dr. Bowman is the dean of the School of Public Health. He's a renowned expert in the statistical analysis of brain imaging data. Aside from their numerous accolades, Dr. Lynn and Dean Bowman are also incredible colleagues. So I am going to join you here, and I'm so excited to have this little Oprah-style chat <laughs> this afternoon for both our uh, in-person and virtual audiences. So we'll go ahead and get started. So my first question is for both uh, President Coleman and Dean Bowman, perhaps President Coleman first. The type of engagement we're celebrating today exemplifies how researchers on university campuses bring solutions to the betterment of society. But this type of engagement is not always valued by the academy. What can we do to encourage and to show faculty that this type of engagement is valuable and how can we change this narrative? Do you want me to start? I would like you to start. <laughs> well, I, I, feel, I feel really passionately about this because I guess it was during my time as president that we went through the financial crisis. Mm. A million jobs were lost in Michigan in a very short time span. And I felt like that we were in a stage where uh, people thought the state wasn't going to survive and certainly that the university wasn't going to survive. I, I remember getting um, sort of comments from people at national meetings saying, well, uh, you know, what's happening at Michigan? Can you, can you survive this sort of incredible catastrophe? And so it really um, reintroduced me to the interest of the of the public university mission, which is to help the people not only who are at the university and on the campus, but people in the communities and in the state. And, and that was, I think that was one of the things that was sort of a shot in the arm for me to, boy, get going and get out there and talk to people and find out what we can do. But uh, <laughs> that was my sort of wake up call. I, I mean, I'd felt it before. And I'd been at universities that had a big public mission, but I think. Michigan had the kind of resources and the breadth and the depth of the talent of the scholarly work that really made this work extremely impactful. Thank you for that. Dean Bowman? Sure. Uh, so just to build on President Coleman's remarks, and I think they're spot on, that I think even as we look toward the future, uh, the value of uh, institutions of higher education will in part just be determined based on the degree to which we're perceived to be making direct contributions to, to society for the betterment of society. And you know, to be clear, I, I think we have done this in the past. I think we're doing it presently, and I think we'll continue to. But uh, as you know, sort of the premise embedded in the question, 
these types of activities or efforts don't always necessarily align with our academic norms. And I think mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing that we're gonna have to be more intentional about as we, as we look toward the future. And so the, the few thoughts that I, would, that I would offer, you know, I think we'll have to shift to creating a culture of, of engagement and public engagement in institutions of higher ed and, and the three things that, at least three things that I think we'll have to do uh, to do so, and no, by no means an exhaustive list, but, but I think we have to look at and, and think about our norms around promotion uh, and tenure and how we evaluate and ensure that those are in line with and in sync with this important work that, that needs to be done. And I, I think there are possibilities there. Um, I, you know, thinking about the areas of, of research, education, and service, sometimes these things fall within the service arm, but I think there's a way to regard uh, these activities in the research arm and possibly even education as that, as that broad arc of, of research and a way of really disseminating the work to have higher impact is, is, is one natural thing. The second thing I would point to is training. Uh, we have to teach, and, uh, teach our faculty and support our faculty in these efforts. These things are not easy. We, we don't always get training on how to do them, and, and it can push faculty outside of their, their comfort zones in doing so. And, and they're, it, it can be risky, right? There's some missteps. And so providing training and support uh, for our faculty will also be important. And then the last thing I would, I would offer is uh, doing things just like tonight. So President Coleman, thank you for this event, these awards, because I think it's recognizing and placing value on exemplary models uh, like, like Luke and Marissa yeah. uh, and really highlighting those you know, at, the, at the highest levels of the, of the institution. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank, you. thank you both for that. And, you know, this is where I'll just add, I think uh, you know, our public mission, in, in theory, all scholarship and research and universities have this mission, but I think here at the university with our, our public mission at the forefront is perhaps easier for us to embody this, or at least I hope so, and then of course faculty like you demonstrating it and modeling it for your trainees um, is, really, is really how it happens next. Okay, my next question for Dr. Schaefer. You've dedicated your research career to eradicating poverty and addressing the impact of poverty on families and communities. This has led to the creation of Poverty Solutions, influenced the expansion of the child tax credit, and you volunteered your time to inform policymakers who share your ambition to alleviate poverty. Was learning how to translate this research into um, uh, impact natural for you? How, did you have mentors along the way to help guide you? Was it something you actively pursued or taken interest in or happened by nature or chance? Help us learn from your path so that we too. Uh, well, it was always how I wanted to uh... Uh, do my work was to have it connected to uh, the world and try to have impact. That's sort of the thing that gets me up in the morning is uh, things changing in the world based on evidence and uh, that I think will help families, empower families to live healthy and productive lives. I have really always had the benefit of being in uh, units that were incredibly supportive of this. So starting at the School of Social Work, I can remember the day I published my first stop ed while I was an assistant professor and my colleagues, it might have been Joe Himley, now the uh, uh, interim dean, sort of cheering me on about that rather than saying, well, you really should be you know, writing your journal article right now. And uh, the Ford School of Public Policy, you know, just really uh, being enthusiastic about this uh, type of work. And uh, actually, I just wanted to mention Cynthia Wilbanks. There have been a number of times in my career where uh, re evidence has sort of led me to think, for example, that the state of Michigan was erroneously charging tens of thousands of people with unemployment insurance fraud when they weren't actually fraudulent. And so I felt compelled to write the Department of Labor about that, but clearly that was going to be an awkward thing um, for the university connecting with the state. And she really just took an approach of saying, you know, we talked through it, she wanted to understand that, and then she was supportive. So um, I've just really appreciated being at uh, U of M and my units in uh, supporting that work. Uh, to the question, so I, I don't know that I've had one mentor along the way. Uh, the one lesson that I've really learned is uh, the lesson of starting my inquiry with listening. Uh, I think every, insight uh, that I've had to whatever extent that I've had it uh, has been from sort of listening to a community partner or a policymaker and trying to start some of my work based on their interests, right, what they, they bring up. 
So that has had me uh, study many things I didn't expect to ever study, like auto insurance and, uh, and um, oral health care, right? Those are uh, things I never expected to go on. But the benefit is I didn't have to convince anybody that those things were important, right? Which is often, I think, where scholars um, you know, have their own agenda and the first step is to convince people that's important. And sometimes you have to do that, but other times if, if you take what are on people's minds that are fit you know, the, together with the things that you think are important, it, it sets you a, a step ahead. Yeah, thank you for that. I think one of the things I hear resonate when you say that is um, it's, the, it's what you want to do when you get out of bed in the morning, right? I think the public impact is the thing that most scholars sort of dream of having that part, but sometimes get lost a little bit along the way in our mm -hmm. academic tracks, mm -hmm. and, and uh, that's what we have to help think about getting back mm -hmm. to, and I love the part about, about listening um, as well. Uh, so, um, let's see, my next question here is for Dr. Eisenberg. Um, the pandemic turned all of our lives upside down, and the models you helped create for policymakers predict and forecast scenarios at a time when people couldn't anticipate what tomorrow would bring. You really pivoted. I, it really struck me in, in your video. Uh, how did you insert your expertise into the forefront of the public health dialogue? Um, you knew you had something that was going to be of tremendous value, but um, it's hard sometimes to make that connection between what we know is of value and for what policymakers might need to hear. So how did you connect up in that way? Yeah, I think, so I think this like sort of, uh, underscores maybe the importance of starting to build these connections earlier because it, it, it built off of pre, you know, we had previously worked with MDHHS on other, on other problems and other topics. And so, you know, some of those connections were already there and then they could kind of be activated, not to the level that they are now. I mean, you know, now we're talking all the time, but you know, it was a, it was a, a, a little groundwork that could then be elevated into something that would work. Right. And so I think, um, I think that maybe underscores the importance of building that groundwork for a lot of different things because then you can grow it into something bigger when you need it, right? And so, um, so yeah, so I think that that's kind of how it, it got started. Connections between my group, the School of Public Health, you know, other folks with policymakers that were kind of already there but nascent. And so we kind of grew them and yeah, and started working. That's, that's a great tip. And I think the, um, uh, for your ability to really have uh, U of M shine for the state during this past time um, uh, of need. Uh, we're just, we're so grateful for that, uh, as well as for the public, you know, our own public health in, in our communities. Um, so my next president, uh, question is, is back to you, President Coleman. The president's awards were largely inspired uh, by the public impact uh, you've had through national leadership roles that you yourself have taken uh, throughout your career. Uh, you exemplify the spirit of today's awards. You were not only appointed the former Secretary of Commerce um, by the former Secretary of Commerce, Gary Locke, to co-chair the National Advisory Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship. You were also appointed by the former President Obama to help lead his manufacturing, advanced manufacturing partnership agenda. So can you share with us your role in creating what is now known as Manufacturing USA and why you chose to help shape the nation's manufacturing policy agenda? Well, again, this all uh, was time specific because the crisis happened. Michigan had lost all of these jobs. And it's interesting for me to come back after eight years of being away and see how the world has changed. Because back in the late, uh, you know, 2008 to 2011, in that era, globalization was the only thing that people talked about. Everything was going to be globalized. Supply chains will be glo were going to be globalized. Just-in-time manufacturing. You know, we, we, we weren't going to make everything ourselves because it was going to be in this wonderful, harmonious, global thing. Well, guess what? It, that the future was not quite what people expected, and so now we are back to, we better be self-sufficient. But, but the idea was that because Michigan had lost so many jobs, that we couldn't just give up manufacturing. I kept saying, we're, we can't outsource manufacturing. We have to make things in this country. And sometimes I was a pretty lonely voice in saying that nationally. But we have the workforce. We have the people who know how to do this. We have the infrastructure. We have the industry. 
L let's not give that up too fast. And so that, and I think my speaking about that nationally must have been what caught the eye of the White House, you know, th that we had to keep this going. Uh, and, you know, and we were joined by some, uh, you know, the other things that I felt were important is that Carnegie, the Carnegie Mellon president and I were, were put on some of these panels, but all the other presidents were from the East and the West Coast. And I said, that's not where the manufacturing power <laughs> stands. It's in the Midwest. And we are the ones. Now, when you, when you, when you go forward, and, and a lot of that sort of advocacy that I think we went to the advanced manufacturing edition, we got, uh, uh, you know, sort of idea, we got things done. But when you look now and you see what's happened, you know, here GM is just talking about, we're gonna do electric cars here, we're gonna, the world has changed. And we, and we have a tremendous opportunity in this state because we know how to do this, we've got the factories, we've got the people, and I can see this big pivot coming very rapidly. And in fact, I've been asked to be, and the university's been asked to be on some of these initiatives to recruit Intel here to do big chip manufacturing. There are gonna be many chip manufacturers. It's not only the big guys, it's gonna be some smaller companies too. And we wanna be right in that sweet spot because we've got it here. And, and it's, so, so one lesson, the, the, the past doesn't portend the future. We know this. And so keep to our strengths, keep doing what we do right, and we can, we can shift ourselves to the next big thing that's coming. And I believe that we are gonna rapidly go to electrification of the transportation system, and this is gonna be really good for the state of Michigan. Uh, so I'm glad that I was, uh, I was a true believer back in 2008. Yeah, boy, <laughs> so. the supply chain comments sort of resonate now, my word. My word, those words perhaps should have stuck with us a little bit more. I think the other thing I hear from this group is, you know, the ability in not only listening, you listened to what our state was telling, but um, then pivoting really importantly when the time, so you have the expertise and you're ready, and then, but you all also then step up when the time comes to be able to put that expertise forward. So, so and, and there's another, I just want to mention this because I, it's such a, a stark example to me about how innovative the faculty are in this place, it's stunning. So one of my first things I was asked to do is to be a representative for an NSF site visit coming for a big team, the College of Education, uh, I mean for College of Engineering, uh, and they involved a whole bunch of people from all over the country about disposal of, of batteries second life for batteries. Because as we electrify, batteries are gonna lose their punch. We're gonna have all these big auto batteries. What do we do with them? Our faculty are still thinking about, are, are already thinking about that. And they are applying for funding to create a big center in our College of Engineering to deal with this. And I said, you know what? That sort of tells me about what's special about Michigan. I mean, maybe we won't need it for five or 10 years, but we got a group already thinking about it what to do about it, and I love that. So And be advocating for it, that's right. Thank you for that, President Coleman. Uh, okay, the next, my next question for you, Dr. Lin. Um, uh, you've been outspoken on policies that have had negative impact, both perceived and real, on our international colleagues, uh, particularly those from targeted countries. This includes our immigration policies. So how have you tried to use your voice to participate in the national dialogue, importantly, around these issues? And how has the Public Engagement Fellowship factored into your efforts at, at all? So thank you so much for that question. Um, you know, one of the things that really struck, strikes me as um, having been on the committee that evaluates all of our applications for these awards for public impact and awards for national and state engagement is, you know, how much it is, as Luke and Marissa have already said, you know, you do good work but then you also pivot, you find a place, you know, where it really matters. Um, and then you have sort of pre-existing partnerships that really help to elevate that impact. And you need all sorts of, you need the knowledge, but you also, you know, you need the partnerships and, you know, of course you need the moment, right? Um, so the work that I've been doing over the last two years around advocacy for Chinese faculty um, has really been in sort of a very small way this kind of a um, issue where I have done some research on immigration. It's one of my research areas. Um, and then I also knew a lot of um, the Chinese 
scholars at, the, at U of M, particularly in science and engineering. And in about 2018, they started coming to me and saying, you know, we are going to, we want to write a letter to, um, we want to write a letter to Debbie Stabenow. We want to write a letter to Debbie Dingo. We want to, you know, express our concern about um, these federal agencies that are looking at our collaborations with Chinese colleagues and saying, these are evidence that you are betraying the US. This is evidence that you are naively or intentionally selling our secrets to a foreign country. And that just sounded so wild to me. Um, and so, sure, I can help you write the letter. And then it turns out that, you know, this is not just a couple of paranoid scientists, that this is a loosely coordinated national effort from funding agencies like the NIH and the NSF, you know, to the Department of Justice, to the FBI, who are really concerned, as they ought to be concerned, you know, about um, our national security. But then they're sort of taking this, you know, taking this jump and saying, well, because China is one of the countries in the world that we are most concerned about. Um, we have to make sure China doesn't get anything that we've got here. Um, and so I have been, you know, helping to, to publicize this and also helping to work with um, agencies at the, in the federal government um, over the last two years around these issues. And one of the things I think that really makes it possible is this, you know, I knew a little bit. I, there were people who really, who really needed that advocacy um, and so they, who could be partners. Um, there were partners in the funding agencies who said, we're really concerned about this. So we, this might be an unintended consequence, but it's an important unintended consequence. So help us to learn about this. Um, and then you sort of had to be the right time. You had to be able to pivot to it. And I will say that, you know, I have, and I think this is really important about the University of Michigan, I have never been afraid that speaking up about these issues would either harm my career or would harm the university. And the university has always been, you know, very much, you know, in our corner saying, if you think that these are real problems that will affect, you know, not only our relationship with the federal government, but affect, you know, our, uh, the ability of our scientists to do good work, you know, you should, you should go ahead and, and talk about it. You should go ahead and make that public. I know from working with other um, scientists across the country that a lot of people are really terrified. They, people who are tenured, who are chair professors, who have been deans and you know, associate deans, are at this moment feeling like they don't have a voice and that their universities just want them to keep their heads down until this bad period passes. And so I think it's been a real privilege to be at a university um, which welcomes and supports um, the fact that we need to speak up for all of our colleagues. Yeah, thank you so much for that and also for your work on this. And I think the voice of uh, you and your colleagues and the you know, thoughtful academic survey work that you've done around here and then taking your time to present uh, all over the country to policymakers has, has changed the debate some and has really influenced um, the times that we're in. Uh, and, and thank you for highlighting also, you know, the importance of, of our academic freedom and our free speech is, is so important and, and uh, of our concern for our fellow faculty. Uh, my next question uh, for you, Dean Bowman, prior to the pandemic, uh, many people didn't really understand what public health was. And, <laughs> and, and now we really, we have a better appreciation for that community public health moment. Um, and, and we highlighted uh, Dr. Eisenberg's work, uh, but there's many others in our school of public health also who have engaged in lots of ways. And can you tell us a little bit about how those scholars and practitioners have informed us and in some of the work that they've done for our community also? 
Sure, I'd be delighted to. And, and yes, indeed, the pandemic has shown a light on public health, uh, sometimes a, a, a bright, fond light, and at other times, uh, not, not so much so. Uh, but, but it's important for us to remember public health more broadly. And often, you know, public health is at its best when we're preventing things. And that's sometimes hard for the public to appreciate uh, the, the value of things averted. Uh, but it's something that, that, that's important to our work. So uh, I'll give a, a, some examples that come to mind. Uh, one that'll touch upon a recurring theme uh, that, that fellow panelists have mentioned before, and that's the importance of pivoting. And a couple of colleagues in the school, in the Department of Biostatistics in particular, uh, Bramar Mukherjee and Mushimi Banerjee, uh, back in March of 2020, they, you know, as, as COVID was unfolding in very alarming ways, uh, you know, and, and moving from country to country, uh, first, of course, in, in Wuhan, but then places in Europe. I remember there was a time where there was lots of alarm in Italy. They began to immediately get concerned about their home country of India. And uh, with 1.3, 1.34 billion people, um, the, just thinking about the devastating impact that that, that could have for, for their country. And so they pivoted uh, and they used their expertise. They had, had very relevant expertise, but at the time had not been working and applying that expertise to infectious diseases. And so they uh, got together with other colleagues in the school, some other colleagues nationally, and began to try to gather data, model data, and, and to try to predict uh, some, some near-term scenarios that ended up uh, they ended up publishing some work that was picked up broadly by media, um, and it, you know, soon thereafter, our, our colleagues found themselves on you know multiple times per week uh, on on news channels and, and and things like that that ultimately helped to inform some policy uh, making at in, in India at that time. It also brought um, you know some backlash, and so another thing I want to. Uh, reinforce that, that you've heard a bit is is the courage and audacity that it takes you know to do what's necessary to do what is needed for society uh, and, and good things usually come from it a couple of other examples uh, one are some faculty in our environmental health and sciences uh, department began doing some work and in much of this work as I talk about it is was really trying to help reduce some of the uncertainty and for this particular example just uncertainty in terms of how COVID spread and you know we can we can all probably in, uh, recall days where we did things that were rather extreme just because of that uncertainty, and and so they did work where they began sampling air, surface, and sewage uh, to to try to be able to detect and determine uh, exposure uh, and, and transmission patterns. And some of their work showed that you know that that uh, spread through surfaces is relatively rare and and. You know that that kind of information is helpful just to help uh, guide behavior, uh, but but air um, uh, transmission obviously is, is one that we continue to be concerned about. And then the sewage transmission actually was was uh, something that was applicable uh, at the university, even being able to do directed testing or other containment measures where where virus is, is detected. And that work was able to build and. Uh, later, it was, it was, uh, they were funded to do some larger work for the state. So those are a, a couple of examples. I guess one more that I'll point to, and I, I'll be brief because I imagine time is running short, but our communications efforts, we also did a lot to try to push out communications and to put things in plain language. Uh, one of the, uh, the videos that I remember was one narrated and produced, or, or narrated by a, by a child, and it was aimed at a, at a child audience. And, uh, even as a public health dean, I have a small child in the house and found it difficult having those conversations. Felt I needed to do it because my daughter was going to be hearing stories elsewhere. So I wanted to be sure she was prepared for it. But you know, how do you talk about that in an age appropriate way? And, and, and so I was able to use that as a resource to, to allow her to watch the video. And uh, I think it did a lot of good. So those are, are, are a few examples. So those are great examples. And you know, the thing I really want to highlight there is, is the courage. Uh, so it's, it's sometimes easier as academics to keep our head down and talk to other academics and write to our academic journals and you know, get the feedback whether we may like it or not that way. But when we reach out of those comfort zones and start engaging for broader impact, with that comes a lot of different views and 
uh, and opportunities potentially as, as you all have to, to really make a larger difference and with that to to have a lot more different voices in your assorted inboxes. Uh, and with that takes a lot of courage and so uh, a recognition for that. So I think we have time for one more question here and then I'm gonna open it up to audience questions and so I hope folks will think a few things here that you would like to ask our great panelists as well. So um, Dr. Lin, uh, I'll, I'll give you our last question here, um, uh, which is, uh, you have uh, thankfully served on our selection committee for these awards since their inception, which is a great service. Um, so to you, what is the importance of this kind of recognition? And what do you and other committee members value in a nominee as we've looked together at them? Um, if you are ever want to know what the best service job at the university is, it's pretty much this committee. Um, you know, you, can, you get to just see extraordinary work. You're, you're just reminded about how many extraordinary colleagues we have. You know, and every, we now get, I think, you know, reliably 30, 40, um, the, um, nominations for these awards and you read them all and you're like, why don't we have 30 or 40 awards to give out? Um, but I think one of the things that this award has really done is it sort of helped us understand a little bit, you know, people are doing such interesting research and a lot of that research is important for, for society. And so that how do we sort of think about what, how do you take that research and then connect it to engagement? Right, and I think one of the things that we've really seen on the committee over the years is, you know, we can look at some people and you see that um, over time, they're not only doing the very good work of scholarship, they're also making the effort to build towards something with community partners. Um, and that, you know, is done in very different ways. The novelist does that in a different way than the scientist. You know, Luke and Marissa, even though they're in similar professions, did their work in different ways. Um, and so to really sort of encourage us all to think about who are the partners out there, who are the communities. Um, and then I will just jump to the second piece of this, which is really highlighting the Public Engagement Faculty Fellowship, which I should have done in answer to the earlier question. But um, so this fellowship um, that Academic Innovations has put together for faculty has really just, I think, been a gift in sort of showing individual faculty, if you start from what you are doing and look out, who are the partners, right? Who are the partners there that might care about your work, who are the partners that you can help? Who are the partners that you can do something for? And I think it's really in that sort of tradition of service that you, know, you get the amazing um, awardees that we have this year and every other year is just really seeing that people that are faculty are serving others, are serving different communities with the work that they do. So now I'd like to open it up to questions from our audience. Uh, we have colleagues in the audience with microphones, so please raise your hand if you have a question and our panelists will do their best to answer them. And I don't think we have virtual from the, we're, not, yeah, we're just doing questions from the room. I'm sure people, people on hybrid may have questions as well. So. Yeah. Well, so the people online can hear you. Yeah. So this is a question for uh, Dr. Schaefer. Uh, I was just looking at your uh, book, Luke. It's been a few years since you uh, wrote uh, uh, $2 a Day, uh, a great book and amazing summary of your work. Since that publication, what do you think, uh, if you were to think in extreme poverty in the US, what's a hopeful sign, something that's happened since then? that gives you hope? What discouraged you? What's been discouraging since then, in your view? And then maybe what you might see next? Well, uh, as Marissa was starting to model the uh, public health crisis that shaped so many responses, I uh, was completely freaked out about the economic crisis of COVID and completely underestimated the public health crisis, honestly, because I didn't know anything about it. Um, but I was really incredibly uh, scared about the, 
the economic crisis of what it was going to mean for families. We'd never had this much job loss ever. I had also lived through the Great Recession where it took years and years and years to get back jobs, and we saw many years of increased poverty and increased hardship. The federal government took a completely different approach uh, this time around to the social safety net. Um, and I like to think I was a small part of, of that. Uh, a part, the child tax credit, the expansion of the child tax credit was one um, idea that I had been working on with colleagues for a number of years. We published a paper. Uh, actually, when I uh, got my reviews for full professor, uh, I submitted this paper that said, hey, we should convert the, the child tax credit into $250 per child per month, uh, $300 for uh, um, little kids. And that's going to reduce child poverty by 30 or 40 percent. It's going to reduce hunger uh, by 30 or 40 percent. Uh, and it's going to have no impact on labor supply at all. And I remember um, that one of the reviewers uh, wrote and said, well, I guess it's fine for Professor Schaefer and his colleagues to talk about things that could never possibly happen <laughs> in the world. Uh, well, we did it. We did it for six months. And you know what happened is uh, child poverty fell by 30 to 40 percent. And uh, hunger among families with kids plummeted by 30 to 40 percent. There was no impact on, on labor market outcomes. My favorite statistic right now is that uh, we're at an all-time low with the fraction and number of Americans with bad credit. Because through the child tax credit, but also the economic impact payments and expanded unemployment insurance, People got money and they used it to pay down their credit card bills, to pay their mortgage payments. We did not see a tidal wave of eviction. So I, uh, over the last uh, year and a half or so, has been elated, honestly, by what could have been. You know, uh, When I look back just at the last economic crisis and what we have, not to say that people aren't suffering and struggling in so many ways, but we took a very different approach. But we are right now, like right at this very moment at a crossroads. And all of that stuff I just talked about that work went so well is uh, in the rearview mirror in Congress and the president uh, have to choose to act to bring some of that forward. So the child tax credit could be a thing that we did that in one single swoop cut child poverty by 30 or 40 percent. Or we could be a country, you know, we, who did it for, we could be an entirely different future or we could be at a country that basically saw what worked and then decided that we couldn't figure out a way to, um, to make it happen in the long term. And I, I actually don't know what direction that we're going. And, and, and once I'm sure that the thing is dead, I'll be despondent for a few weeks and you should not, you know, just leave me alone. But right now I'm actually still quite hopeful. Thank you for that. I think the, you know, the thing as faculty, you, you get to sit around in this great job that we have and dream up all kinds of ideas. <laughs> You know, and then sometimes they, they get to go into action, and that's, that's academia, and then have it public impact at its best, really. I think we have time for one more audience question, uh, and then we will wrap up and move to the next part of our program. <laughs> Is that against the rules? It's not. <laughs> we, we make the rules. It's All right. okay. All right. So I'll, I'll take the liberty to, to ask the questions. And, and, and first, just a, a quick comment following Luke's remarks. Uh, but it just it, it was a reminder of the complexity at the outset of the pandemic uh, and the work that Marissa was a part of. Um, there was another branch as we were working with the Department of Labor and Economic uh, Opportunity in, in a, the Michigan Economic Recovery Council. But you know there was the issue of saving lives, but also the issue of livelihoods and trying to make sure that people were able to, 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 to get back to work as soon as possible. Uh, but now onto the question uh, to Luke and Marissa. Uh, so you, know, you have done exemplary work, serve as models for other faculty here at the university in this space that we're here to, to recognize today in, in, in public engagement. Um, you're also very well established faculty, right? And perhaps that brings a little bit more flexibility uh, just in you know uh, how you decide about the activities that you take on versus those that you don't. If you were talking to two junior faculty, yeah. newly recruited, uh, and you were trying to help inform and guide them uh, in their career, what advice would you give them? Oh man, uh, well, okay. I mean, I think actually, like you pointed something out earlier about how you've been lucky to be in units where this kind of work has been very much supported, and I feel much the same way. You know. Um, I think, 
there, it is, it is easier, like post tenure, to make the kinds of, you know, I, I didn't publish as many papers during COVID as I probably would have had I not been doing this work, you know, but um, I, I. Even, I think, so if I was talking to a new, brand new, newly minted junior faculty, it's worth it anyway. I mean, you know, you, you've got to do, you'll do your best work if you're doing the stuff you love. And so, yeah, just go for it. I, yeah, that's what I would say. I mean, it's not practical maybe, but do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I absolutely like that. I, I also uh, would say that there are ways to be strategic and uh, just because you're doing public engagement, does not, you know, mean that totally. you're not. I think sometimes we think of these as a, yeah, binary choices or deck, and um, and sometimes it takes some thought to think about where is the academic article here. Uh, but you can you can figure out a way to do community engaged work and be successful in in the standard sort of output. I I'd like to just add something to that because I think what what you all bring and what many faculty bring is you bring an expertise and a scholarly discipline and, 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 and rigor yes. that is really important. That is, you, you, it's evidence-based, you can, and when you go and talk about the child tax credit, I mean, that morphed into public policy, but you had such good data rather than have people develop policies and they don't know whether it's gonna work or not. I mean, so, so that, I think that is one of the best arguments about using your scholarship that you learn then to find ways to, to make sure that this improves our lives. Because what are we about? I mean, we're, we're developing new knowledge to improve our lives. And you're fabulous examples of doing this. And so I think that is one of the best arguments for why we should do it. So. Yeah, I mean, it turns out you have to have that scientific foundation or you know that scholarly foundation. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Anyway, yeah. Well, I can't think of a better way to end than on that. So if everyone can give a, a big round of applause, please, for our panelists. Thank you to the audience. Thank you so much. So I would now like to introduce uh, Chris Kolb, the Vice President for Government Relations. Chris is responsible for providing university-wide leadership, strategic vision, and effective management of the University of Michigan's government relations program at the local, state, and federal levels. Chris is also a really great colleague uh, with incredible experience and expertise and a mean ping pong game. Um, please join me in welcoming uh, Vice President Cole. I just got my cue, so perfect. Well, thank you, Rebecca, I really appreciate that. And I'm going to go off my written remarks real quickly, just to say I've been around uh, Lansing uh, for over 20 years, and, and I know the impact uh, that University of Michigan has had on our state uh, because of that. But the last two years prior to joining the university, I was the governor's first budget director. And so I understand one, uh, the proposals that came up, and Luke and I were talking beforehand, it was a shame how many of his proposals I was torn between which ones we should fund and which ones we shouldn't, because they all were great, but there's only so many times you can spend the dollar bill. Uh, we learn in Lansing you can only spend it once. DC has a little different accountability, but, but in Lansing you can only spend it once. And then two, talking about uh, being on the, the governor's cabinet when we're dealing with a, a pandemic, one that we've never seen in our lifetime and understanding how much the governor and her team relied on the information that was coming from the University of Michigan to really help inform their decisions. And so I know firsthand that this is really important work, but I know how as an entity like the state or a local government, we utilize that in the communities whose lives are improved. So I just wanted to put a little exclamation point that this is really important stuff so I get the honor, really, to move us to the next part of our program. And, you know, for over the past decade, the university has worked to elevate our mission to serve the people of Michigan and the world. And we have, you know, really sought to emphasize the valued public engagement of our faculty. We have witnessed programs launched all across our campus 
to give our faculty the tools to learn how to translate their research and their expertise to maximize the impact on society and to make life better for individuals and families across our state and our nation. And today, we'll hear about two such programs, and I have the privilege to introduce both of them. The first essay in engagement featuring the Institute of, of, of Healthcare Policy and Innovations Policy Sprints. So please join me in uh, welcoming Dr. John Ayayan and Dr. Alex Peel. John and Alex, please join me. So I'm John Ayanian, the director of the Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation and a faculty member at the Medical School, the School of Public Health, and the Ford School of Public Policy. And it's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to a program known as Policy Sprints, which was launched four years ago by the Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation, also known as IHPI. We're a university-wide institute. We just celebrated our 10th anniversary last year. The, we were established by the Board of Regents in 2011 with our mission to improve the quality, safety, equity, and affordability of health care and to improve health as a result. So we focus on collaboration, evidence, and as is the priority today, impact. So what are policy sprints? These are teams that we fund from across the university, including our, and our Dearborn and Flint campuses, where we have IHPI members, uh, to address pressing health policy questions around access to care, quality, costs, health equity. Uh, we've funded 14 projects since 2018. These are IHPI faculty teams that can apply for up to $10,000 in support. And once we select those teams with the most promising proposals, um, we have them identify a timely research and policy question. We support them in conducting rapid research. Many um, university research projects can take years to develop and, 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 and implement. Uh, policy sprints typically are completed in a three to six month period. And then we help them generate an IHPI policy brief that highlights their results and policy considerations for policymakers and community partners. And then we support them in engaging with stakeholders to disseminate the findings of their policy sprint research. We have a very talented team supporting them, two professional staff members at IHPI, Eileen Kostanecki, who's based in the university's DC office representing IHPI, and Sarah Wang here on the Ann Arbor campus. They're also supported by Dr. Renu Tipernini, who is our policy faculty advisor. The three of them work closely with our policy sprint teams to make sure that their, impact, their work is translated to impact. So some examples of policy sprints that we funded are shown here on topics ranging widely from COVID-19 testing and ramp up here in the state of Michigan, new guidelines and priorities around access to heart transplants, telehealth use here in Michigan and nationally, the effect of climate change on older adults, and Tobacco 21 regulations here in the state, raising the age for purchase of tobacco. Many of our policy sprints have academic products. Almost all of them lead to published articles in peer-reviewed journals. Some examples shown here uh, focused on surprise billing for elective surgery, uh, for access to uh, special heart valves. And another example that you hear about in more depth from my colleague, Dr. Alex Peel, looking at prenatal care guidelines and how they can be updated to the 21st century. And many of our policy sprints are widely covered in the news. Our policy engagement team and communications team really help to coach and support our faculty in translating and communicating their results through the media. So these policy sprints have received coverage in NPR, the New York Times, the Detroit Free Press. And what we ultimately hope for is that our faculty do have an impact on policy. And one of the best examples of that was a team led by Dr. Karan Chabra from the Department of Surgery that did very important work looking at surprise billing for elective surgery. And that work actually led to a congressional briefing and it helped to inform a new law that was passed by Congress in December of 2020, the No Surprises Act to protect patients and families from surprise bills. So I'd now like to uh, uh, welcome Dr. Alex Peel, uh, who led one of our recent policy sprints, and so she can share how that work is being translated into policy action in her field. 
Dr. Peel. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm Alex Peel. I'm a practicing OBGYN and a health services researcher. I'm also the director of prenatal care redesign for the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, which is the leading maternity care organization in the United States. I'm excited to share how IHPI's policy sprint has impacted my work to improve prenatal care. As a practicing OBGYN, I noticed a pattern in my underserved patients. Patients would come in for their initial appointment, they'd complete their anatomy ultrasound and their third trimester testing, and then they'd disappear until shortly before delivery. And when I asked where they'd been, they had reasonable responses. I had to take two buses to get to you. I was missing work. I couldn't find childcare. It turned out that our appointments that lasted 10 minutes and involved briefly checking the heartbeat weren't valuable to our patients and they were voting with their feet. Traditional prenatal care delivery involves 12 to 14 in-person visits, which accounts for about over 40 hours of care in the course of a pregnancy, and that's if everything goes right. That's a full work week. And when I dug into the evidence, I found that this prenatal care model had remained the same since 1930, when the visit schedule was first established to detect preeclampsia. The model that we thought was helping our patients, in fact, was often burdening them and disadvantaging them. So I found that my training as a clinician had really not prepared me to address these kinds of big picture issues that my patients were facing in the exam room. And so I sought out additional training in health and health policy through the National Clinician Scholars Program at IHPI. I came to Michigan in 2018 to be part of this fellowship through IHPI, and I hope to advance my skills in research in health and health policy to be able to improve maternity care, not one patient at a time, but hundreds or thousands of patients. And early in my fellowship, I applied for the policy sprint at IHPI to do some foundational work on prenatal care delivery in the United States. The policy sprint provided funding to develop foundational knowledge on redesigning prenatal care delivery. And the funding was for two key questions. The first was, how does prenatal care in the United States compare to peer nations? And we did a systematic review looking at how our care compared to those other nations and what alternative models might be possible. The second question was fairly revolutionary. What did patients want out of their prenatal care? And so we did a patient survey to explore alternative models of care that could be promising, not just for us as clinicians, but also for our patients. What we found was that the United States recommends more prenatal visits for low-risk patients than any other peer country, and had better uh, than those other countries have better maternity care outcomes than we do here in the US. We also found that most patients preferred fewer prenatal visits than the traditional model, and they were open to virtual care and flexible care models as well, suggesting that care could be done a little bit differently. So like many of the presenters today, my work also pivoted uh, with the pandemic. Our foundational work was completed in 2019, and in March 2020, we had to change prenatal care overnight using targeted visit schedules and telemedicine almost instantly. We used what we had learned from our prior work and the literature, as well as patient preferences to design this model. And our new recommendations were recognized very early in the pandemic by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists as the leading policy for prenatal care during that time. Because of our leadership during the pandemic, I was asked to chair the Plan for Appropriate Tailored Healthcare and Pregnancy Panel, or the PATH panel which included 19 national maternity care leaders from across specialties, public health, midwifery, OBGYN, pediatrics. And we created a new set of prenatal care guidelines to guide not only care during the pandemic, but also beyond. Just to give you a glimpse of what that care looks like, rather than that one size fits all schedule of 12 to 14 visits that you saw earlier in the presentation, the PATH panel recommended a more nuanced, tailored approach to prenatal care to meet individuals' needs and preferences. You can see that the schedule starts with screening for medical, social, and structural determinants of health, recognizing non-medical factors are critical to patients' pregnancy experience. 
And those factors shape tailored prenatal care plans for patients, not only the visit frequency and monitoring, but also the incorporation of telemedicine and having support for social and structural determinants an inherent part of the care plan. In areas of clinical equipoise, the panel recommended incorporating patients' preferences to determine that final care plan. So now, rather than just creating a set of recommendations as academics, we are seeking national stakeholder feedback. We're looking to professional organizations, to public health groups, also to patient advocacy groups, and going directly to patients to understand how this model affects individuals and what it will take to have true implementation. We launched a listening tour of February of this year in collaboration with IHPI. They helped to assemble a broad group of stakeholders and also to help keep us in touch with them as we move through the next stages of planning. So I could not be more grateful for the training, training and support that I've received through IHPI, which have prepared me for a career dedicated to improving my patients' lives through practice, research, and policy. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, John and, and Alex, for the great and informative uh, presentation. Our next essay features a program administered by the Center for Academic Innovation and in partnership with public engagement units across the campus. The Public Engagement Faculty Fellowship works to foster more and more effective faculty public engagement by helping faculty with the support needed to think through what it means to be an engaged scholar, and the different ways expertise can be used to impact change. So please welcome our next speakers, uh, Elise Auerbach and then Stephanie Leiser. I'm not sure how to advance the slides. Uh, thank you everyone so much for having me and truly President Coleman, Vice President Cunningham, Vice President Cole, I so appreciate the opportunity to talk about the fellowship program today. I'm Elise Auerbach. I lead the Public Engagement Initiative with the Center for Academic Innovation uh, and I'm also a Civic Science Fellow with the Association for Public and Land Grant Universities. Um, before I talk about the program itself, I'd actually like to just pause for just a second and talk about the origin story. And so uh, to that end, uh, I'd like to see the next slide, please. In 2017, as many of you know, uh, a presidential focus area was launched to help support faculty public engagement at the University of Michigan. And recognizing that the words public engagement mean lots of different things to lots of different people, as Dr. Lynn referenced, uh, and th there was already an incredibly rich history of engagement work here at the university. The Center for Academic Innovation, along with partners in the offices of research, communications, government relations, the provost's office, and the National Center for Institutional Diversity, held a participatory meeting series uh, that was really intended to do a number of different things. Number one, to landscape the different organizations that already existed to support engagement work. Number two, to develop a more coherent approach to the language describing different forms of engaged work here at the university. And number three, to surface opportunities and needs articulated by engaged faculty and professional staff here at the university to try and help our decentralized, complex, nuanced campus to be able to work more coherently. During this process, next slide please, uh, we learned that there were over 150 programs or units that support different forms of engaged work from community-engaged scholarship uh, and learning projects like those sponsored by uh, the Detroit Urban Research Center, by Poverty Solutions, by the Edward Ginsburg Center. We learned about K-12 education and outreach programs like, those, uh, like Wolverine Pathways and those sponsored by the Center for Educational Outreach. We learned about opportunities to host exhibitions and develop exhibits, including those in our campus museums. We learned about opportunities to share research with the media and with government relations, uh, including with some of the wonderful professional staff colleagues who are, who are here in the room today, and lots and lots and lots of others. But what this diversity also highlighted was that there was a key gap, a really key gap. How do we support engaged faculty to find the right opportunity at the right time to help them explore their ambitions to have public impact and then give them the tools necessary to help make sure that that engagement work is ethical, effective, and engaging? 
And so the Public Engagement Faculty Fellowship Program was fundamentally designed to address these goals. And as uh, Vice President Cunningham noted earlier, this really relies on the notion of fostering professional courage and in leaning in to trying to figure out where there's a valuable intersection between your scholarly interests and your ambitions for public impact. Next slide, please. So the faculty fellowship program is designed for faculty who are interested in exploring their interests um, and their ambitions in public engagement, in connecting uh, with a like-minded group of interdisciplinary and interprofessional faculty across all of our schools and colleges, across all disciplines, uh, and really trying to build community in a way that also created an opportunity to deepen and build skills and to receive recognition for their work in a way that was citable and presentable in professional experiences, including like the ones today. Next slide, please. The program has two phases. The first phase, the studio experience, is a capacity building phase. Uh, during the capacity building phase, the studio, uh, faculty fellows and mentor fellows gather together in five weeks of an intensive cohort experience. During this time, they have the opportunity to network with many campus partners, including a number of the ones uh, in the room right now, um, to learn about different forms of engagement, to reflect deeply on their ambitions, and to try and think about how to build skills uh, and work towards building skills to engage in whatever means feels most effective and appropriate for them. And then the second phase, project, or the second phase, project support, is really about fostering those ambitions and taking them to the next level. So faculty who uh, complete the project support phase can receive up to $10,000 in in-kind support, not just for the Center for Academic Innovation, but also from many of our campus partners to really think about connecting the dots between their ambitions for public impact and the right uh, professional support um, that can enable them to accomplish these. I should also mention that the program uh, makes an active effort to support public-facing uh, publication opportunities, including by partnering with publication outlets like The Conversation. So together, we really hope to foster, as Luke re referenced, this sort of intersection of strategy and public engagement, of thinking about um, engagement and engagement identity as a core part of a scholarly identity. And we really work to try and foster that in community. So I'm pleased to say that the program is now entering its third year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and I'm extremely honored um, that the Faculty Fellowship Program has, to date, welcomed faculty from 16 of U of M Ann Arbor's schools and colleges. And you can see uh, this year's current cohort, the 2022 cohort, up on the screen. And so I offer my congratulations to them. Before I end and to turn things over to um, what our colleague Stephanie Leiser, I'd really like to just highlight that these programs are valuable, but they also require a lot of support. That engaged faculty work in partnership with professional staff to help support these types of ambitions. And there's a really crucial role for ongoing support of programs like this in order to help create uh, and maintain the, the status of the University of Michigan as an engaged institution. So I'm very pleased to now hand things over to Stephanie Leiser. Uh, she is a fellow from the inaugural cohort of the Public Engagement Faculty Fellowship uh, to describe her experiences with the program uh, and with her engaged work. Thank you very much, Elise, and thanks to everyone for having this event and, and inviting me. Um, I'm Stephanie Leiser. I'm a lecturer at the Ford School of Public Policy and a faculty affiliate at our Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy. I was a participant in the inaugural Public Engagement Faculty Fellowship cohort in the spring of 2020, which was obviously an interesting year, but high enough on all of our priority lists to make sure that we made it happen anyway, and thanks to Elise for that. Uh, the moment I heard about this program, I signed up for their drop-in coffee hour to learn more and knew that I was ready to prepare my application. As someone who has always been in public policy, now in academia, but before in my career in government, um, public service is, is integral to everything I've ever done and everything I do now. Is I don't view it as something extra or separate. Uh, so I was very excited to, con to connect with others at the university who shared that sense of mission. Um, what I did not realize when I started the fellowship was the incredible breadth and depth of public engagement already happening at the university. And I think that's something, uh, an ongoing theme of this event is how much is already happening. And so I, I think what it made me realize is I had been thinking about public engagement in a fairly narrow way compared to what I would have uh, learned through this program and in terms of, you know, I'm from the Ford School, we do policy, we do advocacy, we, we write op-eds. Um, but through the fellowship, I met 
my incredible cohort, and I'll just give you a couple quick profiles. Um, I met a photographer who leads workshops to foster artistic collaboration between students and incarcerated people. I met a botanist who works with tribal communities to grow, harvest, and rematriate uh, traditional corn and squash crops to their communities of origin. I met a public health scholar who conducts community-based research on how racism-related stress influences the health of young black Americans, and on and on. So it was just incredible to me to see what public engagement means on this broader scale and what people are already doing. So what resulted from this studio experience, um, our shared experience in the program was an exhilarating like cross-fertilization of ideas. Uh, the Public Engagement Faculty Fellowship gave me a framework to think about all the different modes of engagement, how they complement one another, and how they can be braided together in an overall strategy in ways that I had never imagined, fathomed before. It also plugged me into a network of thought partners, resources, and support for which I am grateful every single day. Uh, I no longer feel like I'm on my own in figuring out how to do the engaged work. I have this whole network, including Elise and her colleagues, to um, bounce ideas off of, touch base with, and, and, and give me guidance and support as we do this important work. Um, so I did the uh, studio experience in 2020, and since then I've moved on to the project phase, which is the second, pa the second phase of the program. Um, and I've used the support through the project phase to supplement and enrich my work on local government financial transparency. So this is a, a new uh, topic. We've talked a lot about public health and, and policy, so this is a quite technocratic topic. Um, so our project is to create an open data standard for local government financial reporting starting here in Michigan. And so we've heard again and again this afternoon about starting planting your seeds with your networks and talking with them and figuring out what it is they need and then thinking about ways, well, here I am at the University of Michigan. Why am I at this giant university if not to bring to bear those resources on what these communities I'm working with need. And so, um, you know, I'm pretty far away, I think, from an academic paper on this, and I think you'll see why, but I think eventually we'll get there. Um, so here's my slide kind of in a nutshell looking at what we're doing. Uh, local communities each spend thousands of dollars every year, the University of Michigan included as a government entity, to create their annual audited financial reports. These are the go-to source of information to find out how our local governments are providing clean water, reliable transportation, police and fire services, et cetera, the essential services that we take for granted to get through every day. The problem is that these reports are published as PDF documents, right? And that's my stack of papers right there. And as a colleague of mine said, PDFs are where data go to die. Um, as a result of this way of doing things, this antiquated way of doing things, our local officials are currently spending countless hours cutting and pasting these data into reports to the public, to the state, to the Census Bureau, to municipal investors, and many other stakeholders. And I would add, too, researchers like myself have spent a lot of time cutting and pasting data out of these PDF documents to get good, reliable information for our research. And so our goal is to unlock these data and get them in a format where they're easily accessible and usable for all of these stakeholders. Uh, we've partnered with a nonprofit called XBRL, which has created open financial data standards around the world, including the standard that public companies use to report their financial information to the Securities and Exchange Commission here in the United States. Um, our other major partner and the first pilot location for this project is the city of Flint. With the generous support of the Mott Foundation in Flint, XBRL, and our other corporate partners, uh, Workiva and Core Filing, we are currently busy at work to design and implement this new data reporting system in Flint. And I think it was uh, Dr. Schaefer who mentioned doing things you never expected to be doing in the course of this work. So I have learned an awful lot about 
uh, coding in XBRL and the technical processes that go into this. And I'm, I'm an accounting person, I'm a finance person, this is not my normal language, but I've learned an awful lot about it and it's been really interesting. Um, support from the public engagement faculty fellows, fellowship specifically will allow us to expand the pilot phase to include three additional pilot sites in small rural local governments this summer. Uh, we want to ensure that the system we create is easy to use not only for larger, more professional local governments like Flint, but also for smaller communities throughout the state that do not have the same level of resources and capacity. Support from the fellowship and the Center for Academic Innovation is also helping us build the infrastructure to carry this engaged work forward from honing our message and communication strategies to project planning to data visualization. We're free to do what we do best because we know there's a whole team, including Elise, that are ready to help us. So thank you for this opportunity to tell you about the Public Engagement Faculty Fellowship and about our project. Congratulations to the award winners. And thank you to everyone at the university for uh, putting our public mission at the front and center of what we do. Well, thank you. What a wonderful program this afternoon, and thank you for our last speakers here. I want to thank all of the faculty presenters uh, and also the faculty around the university that are doing so much of this great work that we're going to see in future years, I, I know, making us uh, continuing our reputation as a great public university in the state of Michigan and beyond. Uh, so I want to uh, uh, conclude here today with welcoming us to the reception next door. Um, and excited to see what we have uh, coming forth next year. So thank you everyone for the afternoon and let's go and celebrate our awardees in the, in the room next door. And go blue, of course. <laughs>